girl, happiness starts with gratitude, and gratitude wants to chew on. He has over 650 gratitude wins videos posted on YouTube. And I haven't seen all 650 of them, but I've seen a lot of them, and they are great. It's not enough to get them the radio on. normally speak when people are wrapping up their lunch so I apologize if you are just digging into your chicken because I have a very active talk that involves you folks as well as me so I'll apologize ahead of time by show of hands how many folks here have suffered a significant personal loss in your life about 80 90 percent I am fortunate enough to go to high schools where the average age is 17 to 18 and in the nursing homes where the average age is 80 to 90 maybe 95 as you'd expect in the nursing homes, everybody raises their hands. But what really shocked me is in the high schools, half the kids raise their hands. A significant personal loss by the time they were 18. I'd like to very briefly tell you about my significant personal loss. September 29, 1998, it was a Tuesday. I woke up and I looked in bed next to me and my wife was not there. But that's funny, I wonder where Dana is. Just then, Connor, my four-year-old, comes running in. Where's mommy? I don't know, let's find her. We walk down the hall, we look at a couple of rooms. Kyle, my 14-year-old, comes in. Where's mom? We go, we don't know. We're looking for her. So we look in a couple other rooms, and then we walk down to the end of the hall, and we look downstairs, and here's Dana in front of the washer and dryer, all curled over, crunched over. It didn't look good. So we go running down there. I turn her over. There's all this stuff coming out of her mouth. Connor starts crying. What's wrong with mommy? I don't know. I start doing chest compressions, mouth to mouth, Kyle. I said, go get the police, go get the fire. And within a matter of four or five minutes, we probably had 20, maybe 30 people in our house working on Dana. They had her out on the floor, wires, tubes, those electronic paddles. And for those of you that have gone through something like this, one of the things that you'll notice is that time loses all measure. It doesn't make any sense at all. This little fire person comes walking over to me he goes, Mr. Brooke, we've been working on your wife for 90 minutes. We still don't have a heartbeat. Do you want us to continue? I remember thinking this brain up here, this little CPU we have, goes into shock. It can't really compute anything, but it did manage to compute time. And I thought, 90 minutes. And I looked at the fire person and I said, no, you can stop. And she was dead. And she was 38 years old. And what made it such a challenge for me is that was not the only significant personal loss that I had had in my life. My father, I'm from Seattle, my father is a very successful attorney. He decided to end his life with a shotgun. My mother died of cancer. Two of my best buddies, the night I graduated from high school, crashed and burned in a car. And it went on and on and on and on. I can name 25 people I've lost in my life just like that. And I thought, you know what? This isn't going to work really well for me. I'm going to have to figure out some way to get on in this life and some way to cope. So as I thought about things, I thought, well, I think it kind of depends on how you look at things. 
You've got to decide how you're going to look at things. So here's the first one. I want everybody to stand up, please. I apologize in advance, as I said. And I want you to take your right arm, and I want you to extend it really high. I know you're thinking, I just was eating chicken, Dave. And start turning in a clockwise manner. Now, there's no clocks here, and you can just imagine in the high schools, they have no idea what clockwise is. So I have to show them the watch. Do it in the clockwise manner. Now, just start bringing it slowly down. Keep it going clockwise. Down to your eyes, your nose, chin, chest, waist. Now, what direction is it going? Anybody? What is it? Who said counterclockwise right there? Can you come up front, please? Okay, the rest of you can sit down. Yeah, get a book. There's always a couple of people in the back going like this, like, what just happened? <laughs> I have these for, you get a book, that's all. I just have a louder voice. No, I like your voice. You'd be surprised. Which way is it going now? And they just like all look at me. I have a couple of fraternity brothers that came, come to see my talks occasionally, and one of them comes and he says, you know, I saw your little talk, and frankly, I wasn't that impressed. And he goes, well, how does this work? I said, well, if you're so, like, unimpressed, why do you have to ask me how this works? But it does come back to how you look at things. And how you look at things depends a lot about going left, right, up, down, happy, sad, red, black, whatever it might be. But what I'll mention to you is I had to get something that was going to help me cope. And what it was for me was gratitude. And embracing gratitude is the first of five things I talk about. And I talk pretty fast, so I'm going to try to jam a lot of things in here to get as much content to you as possible. So you'll see in front of you, there's a little three by five card. I'd like you to grab that card, and you're going to need a partner, and you're going to need the pen that goes there too. So you're going to need to pick a partner, and if you have to slide over a chair or two, that's okay. And it says, the Brooker That Gratitude Guide, and it's the little card, and there should be a pen at every desk, and if you've got to change tables, it's got to be two people. It can't be three. Everybody got it? So nobody's changing tables. Okay, so I guess we have all good even numbers. Pat, are you Linda? Oh, you guys are good. Oh, good. And there's Mary. Here's what I want you to do. Upper left-hand side of that card, upper left-hand corner, rather, I want you to write four words. I see you as. I-S-E-E. You as, upper left-hand corner. Upper right-hand corner, write your partner's name. And for those people that are speedy, the very last thing in the lower right-hand corner, sign your name. Now, whether you know this person or not makes no difference, or if you've known him 30 years, like I've known Pat 30 years, Makes no difference. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. And I want you to write and describe that individual, the adjectives that describe them, as fast as you can. I see you as happy. I see you as energetic. I see you as driven. However you see that person, 60 seconds, go. About 20 seconds left. And stop. Now here's what I'd like you to do. I'm going to give you another 60 seconds. Take 30 seconds each and read to each other what you wrote about each other. Go.
Okay, and stop. So now, exchange cards so you have the card that was written about you. And even though that person just read that to you aloud, I'd like you to just silently read what they just read to you. Those things that describe you. And as you read those, by show of hands, how many people here might hold on to that card? Thank you, it's been fantastic being here. I'll see you later next time, next year. Just kidding. So every so often somebody doesn't raise their hand, I go, what's wrong with you? And he goes, oh God, the speaker's picking on me. I don't understand why we view ourselves so harshly as opposed to how other people view us. I don't understand why we say things to ourselves we'd never say to a friend. There's a long time ago I took a word, L-O-S-E-R, out of my vocabulary. And I didn't think it was a very good word and I'd call myself that all the time but I would never say that to a friend. So when you see how somebody else views you, I can hear some, especially when I do workshops, I can walk around the tables. I see you as dynamic, energetic, happy, inspiring, all those different kinds of things. That's what gratitude will do for you. That's a one minute exercise that'll tell you what embracing gratitude will do for you. Because what gratitude does every single day is helps you focus on what you have versus what you don't have. Point number one. Point number two is, it takes as long as it takes. You cannot ever, 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 ever give up Winston Churchill. A lot of people tell me, why do you mention your age? 65 years old. I didn't start this journey until about three years ago. I don't care how old I am. I'm going to do it to 75, 85, 95. I finally find something I was passionate about. Colonel Sanders, 63. Ray Kroc, 58. J.C. Penney, 57. All these people. Mary Kay Ash, 59. They all started these companies in their 50s or 60s. So it takes as long as it takes and you can't give up. Connor was four years old, as I mentioned, when Dana died. He had a heck of a time. I had to hold him back in kindergarten. I had to hold him back in first grade. And he struggled. And then what he even struggled with more was baseball. He couldn't play baseball. And he was so upset. He'd never play. He kept going out. And I was a good parent. Dana died. I was coming to all the practices and everything. And he kept showing up all the time. But he could never play. Heartbreaking. Finally, we get to May 12th, 1995. He's 11 years old. And here is our 2005, excuse me, 11 years old. And they're playing a game, and he never plays. And there's a guy in second and third, the seventh inning, bottom of the seventh, there's two out, there's no players left. So the coach goes, is there anybody left in the dugout? And he goes, well, Connor's down there. So here comes Connor. He comes swinging his bat like he's Babe Ruth. He's never had a hit in his life. And then he did something which is highly unusual. He looks up and then stands and he goes, Dad, I'm up! <laughs> Kids never talk to their parents when they're in the games, but they want you there. But he gets up to the plate, ball one, strike one, ball two, full count. Next pitch comes in, he just rips it down the third baseline, goes into left field, the guy from third comes in and scores. The guy from second comes around, third comes to home, here's the ball, the catcher, the guy, they catch it, they crash together. And the ball pops out. And here's Connor standing out in second base. Dad, I got a hit. <laughs> and they won eight to seven. And I told him that night, I still get a lump in my throat talking about it, where we sat on the bed and I said, you know, Connor, the fact is you never gave up. You know, it was never ever about baseball. And Connor struggled in school. He had to have those special programs, IEDs or whatever they were. Can't remember. But he finished up. He's now in San Diego State. This is a small picture. But he's like 6'2", 3.5 student, and best of all, when he graduated from the high school in Seattle, he was a leadoff hitter on the baseball team. That's what's happened to you, know, Gibb. Thank you. Occasionally, Connor comes and sees me talk, and you're not going to introduce me again today, are you, Dad? I said, no. But I will tell you about, I was talking to Pat about passion. And I will tell you that for the most part of my career, I was in retail, working for Nordstrom and Lowe's and places like that. I wanted to be a speaker when I was 19 years old. I didn't know it was going to be gratitude. I just knew I wanted to be a speaker. I never did it. So finally, about three years ago, Dana had passed away and all these other people had died. And I haven't even told you half the other ones because I want to talk about a gratitude journal more than anything else. Because that's a tool and a toolkit for life. And that's the main thrust of what I talk about. 
But finally, I was managing the Lowe's store, and I had it to hear, and I thought, you've got to stop talking about this. If you're going to be Mr. Speaker, no time like the present. So I come home, it's about 2 in the afternoon. Connor's sitting on the couch, he's 17 now. He says, what are you doing home? And I said, I quit. You quit Lowe's? And I said, yeah. You quit being a store manager at Lowe's? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to be a speaker. And he's sitting on the couch, he looks up and he goes, well, that's just super dad. <laughs> and I don't know what to say. And he takes a breath and he goes, what are we going to do for food? <laughs> I said, Connor, you got to follow your dream. At some point, it'll all happen. There's a lot of things that I noticed about life that you got to get rid of junk in your life. Embrace gratitude, number one. It takes as long as it takes. Never give up. Number three, make room for gratitude. When you go back and get in those cars today, notice the size of that windshield is about two feet deep and about four feet wide. And then notice that the rear view mirror is about like that. I would suggest that's how you view your life. It makes a big, big difference. Now, if you see flashing blue lights in the rear view mirror, you got to pull over. I get it. Oh, by the way, on the little three by five cards, I forgot to mention this. I love that exercise because it tells you how somebody else views you. And again, I don't understand why we view ourselves so harshly. I did try it in the high schools. It didn't work too well, though, because kid shows me the card and he goes, I see you as an idiot. <laughs> he said, OK, that's not kind of the idea. So I'm struggling, and I'm trying to figure out how am I going to get ahead in life. My friends are saying, you're depressed. You're dealing with all these things in your life, and you're trying the best to be a good dad. And this buddy of mine says, you need to get a gratitude journal. Now, how many people here have heard of a gratitude journal? Wow, that's pretty impressive. I had not heard of one. So I got one from Amazon, started to write it, and I started to notice different things happening. And then I did my own, the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. And there's a little saying at the very top here. It says, if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers you. I'll be sitting in the Starbucks writing in my gratitude journal. People walk by and they, what's that instrument that guy's holding in his hand? It looks like a pen. <laughs> it makes such a huge difference to write in this. I write in this every single day. It absolutely changed my life. And I'll tell you very briefly the format because those cards you have, you're going to write something else on the back of them in just a second. The way this is set up is the day and the date. Then there's your daily number, which is the number kind of describes how you're doing today. Ten is the best day of your life. One is the worst day of your life. So whatever that number might be. And then you write what you're grateful for on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, you write what you're going to be grateful for, otherwise known as your gratitude intentions. The subconscious mind up here in the prefrontal cortex cannot distinguish between what you think is going to happen and what actually happens. I've written more and more. I'm, I'm grateful to speak to a hundred of people, to thousands of people. I spoke to 3,000 soldiers about a month ago at Joint Base Lewis McCord, and now I'm going to be going around to military bases all around the country. It used to be I could speak to a hundred people, and I thought it was the greatest thing. How you intend that to happen will make such a huge difference. So here's what I'd like to do. Take that card that you had and flip it over, please. And in the upper left-hand corner, I want you to give yourself your daily number at this very moment. And again, 10 is the best day of your This is this very second. This is just how you're feeling overall. 10 is the best, 1 is the worst. It could be a half. It could be 5 and a half, be 7 and a half, could be 9 and a half, whatever it might be. But whatever that number is at this very moment, put that in the upper left-hand corner and put a circle around it. And then right in the center of the card, do one, two, three, because you're going to put three things. So just put numbers one, two, three. Okay, number one, and do not share this with anybody, by the way. And the other exercise, I don't care if you're talking to somebody else. This is just for you, yourself, and I, the three of you. I want to be sharing this thing, because what if you're having a bad day? It's nobody's business. Number one, what's the number one thing you're most grateful for? Write that down. And for those of you that are speedy, number two is the second thing you're most grateful for. And third and last, what was the highlight of your day yesterday? 
might take a moment to think about what was the best thing that happened to you yesterday. Think about what that was and write it down. So I always try to gauge how fast people are going with their bigger audiences, so hopefully most people have it. So just silently reread the three things you wrote. And as you reread those three things, I want you to put a number in the upper right hand corner. It could be the same, could be something different, but whatever that is, put that number in the upper right hand corner after reading those three things. Okay, so you got a number in the upper left hand corner and the upper and the upper right hand corner. How many people's numbers stayed the same from left to right? Okay? How many's number how many people's number went up? Once again, it's thrilling to be here. I did that to the army, nobody laughed. I thought it was a funny line. But that's that's half the room. Another example. That's a 60-second example of what writing in a gratitude journal will do for you. Now, whether you're at South Texas Money Management or you're at Ronald McDonald House or you're doing any number of things, this thing we have in life is stressful. As I said, I talk to these high school kids and I tell them, this is life. It goes up and down like this. This is a lot of fun. This isn't fun. When you're here, you want to be here again. But down here is where the lessons are learned. We never learn lessons when everything's going great. Everybody's your friend. You learn your lesson when the going gets tough. And you see if you get going and any of your friends uh, might happen to help you. So I will tell you, I don't always bring this up, but I'm going to say this real briefly today because this has become very meaningful me, for me. In the time that I will have spoken today, another soldier will have committed suicide in our country. 22 soldiers commit suicide every single day. And that's why I'm blessed to be able to go down there and talk to them. Well, I will tell you, when you understand the power of gratitude and getting a gratitude journal and recording your blessings and your abundance versus your scarcity, it'll change your life in ways you can't even imagine. My mother did die of cancer, but she was manic depressive. And she did one of the worst things I think you can ever do to a person. She would call me in my teens and 20s and she'd take a little bottle of pills and she'd go like this on the phone she said, I have a bottle of sleepy pills here, and if you don't come over and see me, I will kill myself within the next hour. And I have three brothers and a sister. I kind of was the head of the family, even though I was second born. So I had no choice. So I'd go over and see her and everything, and it's like, God, I'd sit in the bed. What am I supposed to do? And then she dies of cancer. But I got that from her. Well, I'll be doggone if I'm going to take a pill. With all due respect to antidepressants, everything else, I understand there's a place for them. But Dana died of an overdose of Vicodin and Oxycontin. That's how she passed away at 38. So I thought, well, I'm going to take care of myself and I'm going to hang around good people. I'm going to run every day. I'm going to drink water. I'm going to take my vitamin pills. I'm going to write my gratitude journal. I'm going to do all these things. And even still, some days it doesn't work. So I woke up about a year ago and I was a one. Now you guys just got a sense of that number just by doing that little brief exercise. I thought, wow, I guess you better practice what you preach. So I grab my gratitude journal. I go down to a Starbucks and I write in it. And that bumps me up to about a four or five. I'm a little better, but I'm usually at eight, nine, or ten. Then I have a talk to do that day. I drive up to Burlington to do a talk, about 250 people at the Chamber of Commerce. And I'm done, and this lady comes up and she's crying. She says, Can I give you a hug? Of course, I want to do I'm single, of course, I'll take a hug. <laughs> but I didn't. I just said yes. And they're lined up to buy the books. It's just thrilling. It's thrilling to make a difference. And she said, you just changed my life. I said, what happened? Well, that story you told about this, my husband this, my son addicted, heroin, suicide, whatever. Can I get a couple of journals as an example? I walked out to the car. And I looked in the rearview mirror and I went, wow. I'd gone from a 2 to a 4 to a 5 to a 9.5. And, and I didn't snort some powder. I didn't take some pill and drink some booze or whatever it might be, but I went from a two to a four to five to a nine by changing life and by being grateful for what I have. That's what it can do for you. That's the power of being grateful. I'll guarantee you people in this room have been touched by somebody who's done had suicide or something around it. 
I have my, grat my own gratitude journal. These last about three months and people will come up and, is this your journal right here? I go, yeah. Can I look at it? Sure. And they look at it. And I go, uh, they go, wow, you write in this every day. I go, have you been like listening for like, like the last half hour? I mean, if it makes me feel better, wouldn't you want to listen every day? But I think what's interesting to me is that I was talking to Pat about this. I told Pat, I thought about Pat that runs Ronald McDonald House. It's really cool when you can find something you're passionate about. I think the number one thing you got to do is find yourself. The most important relationship you'll ever have in your entire life is the one you have with yourself. A lot of people have a real tough relationship with themselves. That's why they tell you about their cars they buy and all these other things, which I want to go, are you trying to impress you or me? I don't understand. But when you get that relationship down and then you find out what you're passionate about, chances are you'll find out what your purpose is. And I think most people, I was talking to Jeannie when I met her this morning about, I don't know if we'll have the time or not. So I want to know what was the impetus? What got you going with STMM? Fascinates me. Why do people decide one day I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that? How do they get their passion? I've got all these friends. I've got 10 times more dough than I do. But nobody gets to have the pleasure that I get to change lives. But I do think it's important to find out about yourself and how you view yourself. And I know that, again, I was talking to these buddies of mine. I was giving this example. Here's a $20 bill. Andrew Jackson. Now, if I just come over and give you a $20 bill, how many people want this $20 bill? I was like the ones that don't raise your hands. I was like, whatever. No, it's, it's real. And they're going, you've, had, you've made us raise our hands three times now, okay? But it's a $20 bill. I'll just take for granted you all want it. 